Discussion with uh, Amory Slaughter, the CEO of uh, New America, and also uh, she ran policy planning at State Department, uh, first woman to have that job, amongst many other things. Also ran the school formerly known as the Woodrow Wilson School, now uh, uh, renamed. Uh, we're going to talk about, uh, we're basically going to talk about what a Harris foreign policy might look like. and. Uh, as it happens, Anne-Marie wrote a very good piece in the Financial Times about that very issue. So in, in, what, what, are the, what were the main points you, that you made in, the, in that piece? So first of all, it's great to be here on this side of the uh, stage. I've had a wonderful time listening all day. And before I answer Peter's question, I want to make clear I have no particular inside information. I am not plugged into the vice president's office before anybody starts sending me emails uh, to be connected uh, to people <laughs> in her office. I've known Phil Gordon for a long time, and I know Rebecca Listener. Uh, but I was moved to write the piece based on what I've observed. I've seen the vice president at the Munich Security Conference over the past three years. She's, uh, she was, she's been very effective there, particularly this year. She gave a very strong speech on Ukraine. And I was reading her speeches uh, and listening, uh, just sort of listening to her at that point. This was early August. And the main points of the piece were, one, just a woman running for president has always a difficult line or to walk, as Secretary Clinton knew. If some of you will remember Secretary Clinton's 3 o'clock in the morning uh, advertisement where the phone call rings at 3 in the morning and who do you want in the White House? And she was making the point that she was more experienced uh, than Barack Obama. And Kamala Harris doesn't have that kind of experience to fall back on, but of course she was a prosecutor. And she has no problem, as I think we'll see tomorrow night, demonstrating that she's tough uh, and that she's tough enough to be a commander in chief. That's her, her first job. And that, I think, is, is quite clear from uh, both her past and the positions she's taken with President Biden. We're going to talk about specific areas. It's very hard to tell where she differs from President Biden. Uh, Donna Brazil has a great piece in the New York Times today where she points out that, you know, the job of a vice president is not to differ from your principal. It is to back your principal up in every way. Uh, and we've, we, you know, as we've had vice presidents before, Lyndon Johnson, George W. Bush, where you can then see differences, but only once uh, they become president. But there are two areas where I think you can see a difference in emphasis. One is, as a prosecutor, she's obviously, no, she knows how to make deals. That's what prosecutors do. They prosecute, but they also make deals. Uh, and they focus on victims as well as perpetrators. So when you hear her talk about the Gazans, the Palestinians in Gaza, or when you hear her talk about victims in Ukraine, you hear a focus on people and not just governments. And I think we will see more of that. I think she, she focuses on international criminal prosecutions. She focuses on the individual suffering uh, it, wherever there is not only war, but crisis. And so that's a, I, I expect her to be able to play the geopolitical game. But I expect that we will hear an equally strong focus on victims. And the second place I see a difference goes more to her staff. Uh, Rebecca L Listener oversaw the 2022 National Security Strategy, which is a historic document. Many of you have heard me say this before. It is the first ever document, national security document in the United States, to say that what they call transnational threats, I call global threats, but the threats of climate change, infectious disease, food security, energy security, they include inflation and terrorism, that those threats are every bit as important as the geopolitical threats. That means climate change, the next pandemic, we should, that those threats are as grave to the American people as China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. That is a historic statement. I think it is absolutely true. 
that is not how we're spending our money or our time in government. Uh, it's more like 80-20, if that. But I expect that uh, President Harris, you would see an effort to rebalance how we actually approach our national security. Absolutely, we have to focus on the big powers, uh, and she's gonna be tough on Ukraine, on Russia, uh, on China, critical. But last thing I'll say, she's also a Californian. She's seen what climate change is doing to us firsthand. And I expect to see a bigger emphasis from the presidential podium on all those issues. You mentioned um, Anne-Marie Phil Gordon, who is Vice President Harris's national security advisor. He was the top Middle East guy in the Obama administration. He's a Europeanist. I think he wrote a book with Sarkozy. Um, you know, what, you know, if personnel is policy to some degree, uh, what do you anticipate, or is it hard to decipher, like, what his worldview might be and how it might inform or not inform hers? So Phil is, he's a, as you said, he's a wide, broad-gauged foreign policy expert. I mean, I worked with him in the Obama administration when he was Assistant Secretary for Europe, and he speaks European languages, French in particular, but in general, uh, that's a tough job. There are many, many countries, and he was, he was constantly on the road then shifted uh, more to the Middle East uh, more, more recently, makes him very valuable, I think, as, particularly to someone who had been an attorney general and then a senator, but did not have a deep foreign policy background. I, I think, again, as um, consistent with Rebecca Listner's view, Phil is a skeptic about the power of the United States, both militarily and diplomatically, to remake governments, reshape governments, reshape parts of the world. Um, not that I mean, President Biden obviously uh, wanted out of Afghanistan. We, we've just heard who, he was. He wanted that back in 2010. So it's not as if the Biden administration has been full of, you know, let's, let's plant and build democracy around the world. That's not what they've thought. But to the extent that President Biden has been democracies versus autocracies and more of what I still hear as a 20th century Cold War orientation of dividing the world that way, of seeing us versus Russia, us versus China, more in, in Cold War terms. I think Phil is, is more nuanced there about the countries we have to make deals with, about the limits of military power, and maybe about the limits of U.S. power more, more generally. I mean, we heard uh, Vice President Harris say at the convention that she was committed to ensuring that our fighting forth force was the most lethal uh, in the world. She's not backing off of military power, but I would expect quite a bit of care about how that, that power is used. Yeah, I mean, so she has said, you know, the, the People's Liberation Army needs to be able to take Taiwan by 2027. So if Harris wins or if Trump wins, I mean, I, I, I think it, it would be worth taking that at face value. Um, you know, uh, it, it, this is a hard one. I mean, it, it, Admiral Grady was sort of uh, referring it to it in, to some degree, but what do you anticipate would happen? Uh, because Americans probably don't really completely know where Taiwan is, a lot of them. Um, it's not Ukraine in the sense that it's, you know, it, 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 it's not neighboring NATO. Um, but it seems like the big question, I mean, I would be blown away if in Tuesday's debate is not a question for both candidates. What would you do? I mean, President Biden changed the policy, right? The strategic ambiguity, he blew out the window on 60 Minutes. He said, if China invades, we'll respond. You know, um, Trump, you know, one of the first things Trump did when he was in office was call the Chinese, uh, the Taiwanese uh, uh, leader. So what do you, I mean, it's a hard one. <laughs> very, yeah. So tomorrow night, I would expect very little daylight between her and President Biden. I would now, we will defend Taiwan. There are many. That does not mean putting U.S. troops in the field. Uh, there are many ways to defend Taiwan in the ways that we are defending Ukraine. We are stepping up aid of various kinds. Uh, the sort of 
description of, of Taiwan as a, you know a porcupine, a pincushion, a sort of bristling with with weapons and the ability to defend, to defend itself. Obviously, it's also it's not just crossing a border; it's the, it's the Taiwan Strait. But I, I would expect her to to say, you know, we will stand with the Taiwanese. Uh, we will defend Taiwan. Um, in the first place, also, as the first woman president, she is never going to be the person who lost Taiwan, who is going to be soft in that sense. I mean, if you look at women leaders around the world, Golda Meir, Maggie Thatcher, these are not, uh, or um, Indira Gandhi, these are not people who hesitate from using force. And if you remember, uh, Madeleine Albright, who was the first woman Secretary of State, and she had to be tougher than tough. She's the one who said to Colin Powell, what's this famous army of yours for, you know, if we, we can't use it again in, in Eastern Europe? Again, I think that Vice President Harris's instincts overall are to rebalance from military threats and other threats to take account of the the existential threats of climate change, and all we need is one more good virus. I mean, we've, we've just been through that. But I do not expect her to take a public position that would be anything less than tough. I expect her to, to, to do everything she can in the ways of deterrence and to be tough in diplomacy. If this actually happens, I'm not sure we can actually say how any American president would respond. You know, the, the border, of course, will come up tomorrow, and, you know, the Biden administration isn't necessarily going to publicly celebrate this fact, but the border is closed, and the border is closed in the following way. Um, if there are more than 2,500 asylum applicants coming over the border on any given day, the border closes. Well, guess how many asylum applicants is the absolute minimum throughout the Biden administration? It's at least 2,500. So they've closed the border, essentially. So. You know, there's, there's more commonalities on China and border, perhaps, than you might expect between Trump and, 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 and Vice President Harris. Um, you know, how does she make a distinction uh, in a debate uh, with Trump? I mean, obviously, there's NATO. You know, he's said a bunch of disparaging things about it. Is that, do you think, the, the principal difference between them? So on the border, just to, to come back to that, she is, again, as a Californian, and but also given her brief, she was not the immigration czar. That would have been crazy. What she, she did take the brief, and it was a very hard one, of working with Central American countries to try to focus on the sources of immigration. And that is exactly actually where President Obama left. Our former colleague, Cecilia, uh, Cecilia Munoz, uh, it worked also somebody who'd spent her life in immigration uh, rights, but she also concluded, in the end, we cannot deal with these issues at the border. It has to be way behind the border. So I expect her to talk about the importance of Central America and Latin America. And I expect if she's president, she will pay much more attention to Central and Latin America, which is good politics as well well as good national security. On something like Ukraine and more generally with a difference, I think she will point out that she that that we have built, rebuilt our alliances. We are that that's a huge source of our strength and that she has been to Asia three times. She's she's worked with all of our European allies that she has direct relationships with a network of leaders around the world and she's likely to say those to make some distinction that Trump is a unilateralist very transactional and specializes in insulting many of our friends. <laughs> Indeed. We have time for one question. It's got to be brief. This, uh, Ambassador Ashraf Hadari. Uh, thank you so much, um, Afghan Ambassador to Sri Lanka and Deputy Ambassador to United States. Uh, uh, you have had an impressive record on the protection of uh, human rights and especially women's rights. And uh, in Afghanistan, as we all know, uh, conflict, climate, terrorism, extremism, poverty have converged, and most uh, affecting women now, on top of that, a gender apartheid on which uh, uh, the uh, last uh, uh, panel uh, uh, talked about. And I was wondering whether you uh, foresee any change, any departure from the status quo uh, on Afghanistan, both on the gender apartheid under the Taliban, and as well as a uh, growing uh, number of uh, terrorist uh, uh, threats uh, with the resurgence of uh, 
uh, Al Qaeda and ISKP in Afghanistan. Thank you. Yep. I mean, <laughs> the inbox at the White House is always full, uh, and uh, you know, given given the sort of immediate things, this will have to be a longer term strategy. But yes, I think again, as you say, and as many people said at the time, including you, Peter. The, the need to focus more on Afghanistan again because of the terrorist threat will be there. But absolutely, I expect much more emphasis on women's rights uh, in the Middle East, in Afghanistan, and generally, and this is again part of a kind of focus on longer term development and prosperity and human rights alongside a more immediate uh, focus on, on deterrence and, and playing geopolitics. So yes. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie. <laughs>